I'm Gil Oman. I was the third dean of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine here at the University of Washington. I came to University of Washington in Seattle in July of 1969. I'd never set foot in this part of the country before. I came specifically to work with Arno Motelsky in uh, human and medical genetics as a uh, post-residency fellow here in medical genetics. Uh, I was born in Chester, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. I went to local Chester High School. In my graduating class in an industrial town high school of 400, 80 went to college, three went out of state. I went all the way to Princeton. A lot of people thought I'd gone to the end of the earth. Anyhow, I enjoyed Princeton very much. I graduated in 1961, and from there I went to Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, Vietnam-era military duty, assigned to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and in 1969 I came here to Seattle. I had some very wonderful research learning experiences along the way, including a bachelor's thesis project at Princeton, a uh, very nice experience with Lewis K. Dahl at Brookhaven National Laboratory after graduation in 1961. Actually, the year before that, in 1960, I was at Woods Hole Oceanographic and had a terrific and productive experience there, including a manuscript, my first paper, which was in Nature magazine, followed by a detailed paper in Cosmochemica and Geochemica Octa, identifying Triassic shale porphyrins, which were very interesting compounds. After the first year of medical school, I was in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. I worked with a great scientist there named Ephraim Kachowski, later called Katzir. I actually visited him in uh, 2002, 2005, 2007. Uh, he's now 91 years old and uh, is the retired president of the state of Israel. Not the prime minister, but the president, and a venerated and still active scientist. In fact, he's just completed his memoirs, and he still has a lab group in the Weizmann Institute. While I was in medical school, I worked on synthetic polypeptides as models for proteins with a man named Thomas Gill in the Department of Pathology, and uh, he went on to become chairman of pathology at Pittsburgh. And then during my internship and residency at Mass General, I did publish some interesting papers. In fact, I had a paper published when I was a senior medical student at Harvard, a single author paper called uh, Familial Reticuloendotheliosis with Eosinophilia. And I've come to realize when you put that kind of a title on an article, it may lead to an eponym. Anyway, others later called this Omen syndrome, or Omen's disease, and I had the pleasure two weeks ago, in November of 2007, to be at a symposium at Harvard Medical School, where they dedicated a new center for immunology research, uh, where my wife and I contributed to uh, uh, a particular part of the, uh, the center, and where the international symposium included about a quarter of the people who made a living and provided remarkable advances on this very condition. So there was a lot of interest in realizing there was actually somebody named Omen and he was still breathing. So let's uh, focus on 1969. I came here to do medical genetics, and I was already uh, keenly interested about the population aspects of disease, which we call public health. I was um, uh, here to work with a variety of terrific people, but the leader, Arno Motowski, is an intellectual giant of this university and of field of genetics, broadly interested and took a uh, great fancy in the notion I was willing to take some risk. That meant striking out in areas where uh, the path was uncertain and where the likely consequences might be uh, even negative. That's to say I was interested in applying uh, biochemical genetic techniques, what today we would call molecular techniques, to the brain. I thought the brain is a pretty interesting organ. It's a distinctive part of our being, and it hadn't been too greatly exploited scientifically up to that point. What is now a 35,000 person meeting for the Society of Neurosciences was just getting going. The uh, Keystone Brain Research Conferences were just getting going. And Arno uh, said, if you want to take the risk, be delighted if you'd like to strike into this area. You should just realize that for a fellow with your training, the logical path would be to point toward becoming a chairman of internal medicine. 
and uh, here and elsewhere, studying the brain might be viewed as far outside of internal medicine. So maybe that was an indication I was headed in other directions, including the reason I'm being interviewed today. <clears throat> so I did uh, a variety of studies here, including um, compiling the work into a PhD in uh, genetics, the basic genetics department. It was the first time somebody here in human genetics had also done a PhD in basic genetics and tied me into the J-Wing operation here at the university. Met a lot of wonderful faculty and students, uh, many of whom have had sterling careers. In 1973, 74, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation took over a fledgling program that the Commonwealth Fund had started called Clinical Scholars to um, recruit young physicians into careers that would combine clinical work and leadership with health services research, just as we commonly combine laboratory research with clinical work and clinical investigators. The chairman of internal medicine, Bob Petersdorf, called me into his office and said, uh, Gail, I understand you're interested in health policy and you're interested in broader things. I have something I'd like you to do for the school, the university, which is to take the lead in applying for this Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program for the University of Washington, and I'll help you. And in fact, he was the PI and I was the program director. So we put in a proposal, and uh, remarkably, they decided that they would not award it to the University of Washington because of the identified director being deficient in experience in this field, and uh, maybe also because of, during that year I had uh, been selected to go off to Washington for a year and be a White House fellow, during which time I worked on international and national energy issues during the first Arab oil embargo. However, when I came back, uh, we reapplied, and we won one of those uh, precious uh, Robert Wood Johnson programs, and I'm very proud that that program persists to this day here at the University of Washington after numerous competitive rounds and after others who were selected in those first two years uh, have gone by the wayside. My original uh, associate director was a terrific woman named Ann Browder, and subsequently uh, Jim Logerfo became the associate director and then the director, and it's really a splendid asset of this university. The reason it's important to the current topic is that it was a program that brought together medical school, school public health, and the business school. One of the distinctive features is one I've used in many other roles in my life since, which was to create a sort of national war college intensive initial experience for our trainees. When they arrived in July of the first of two years, they entered immediately a summer program of uh, multiple hours per day, every day in the week, uh, partly management and organization and accounting principles and other aspects of uh, business management and organization, plus the core courses of epidemiology and biostatistics, such that after six or seven weeks, they were prepared to think seriously how they're going to make the most of the remainder of their two years, instead of using up the first year, just taking a few courses and then being desperate that their time would be running out before they could get any research done or really define an area of specialized interest. So our clinical scholars program is really quite special from the beginning. In 1977, well, I should say, I was also in the meantime doing this uh, genetic brain research. I was selected as a um, research career development awardee of the NIH, and then I was selected as a Howard Hughes medical investigator, which is a pretty big deal in medical research to this day. After one year of the Howard Hughes, I um, got a quite unexpected call from a man I admired a lot, David Hamburg, who was the president of the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences. I knew him only slightly, uh, but I had given a specialized lecture in 1975, January, at Stanford University. It was a program called The Majesty of Man. It was really um, a set of talks and interviews of Joshua Letterberg, and Arthur Rubenstein, a great pianist. And for warmer uppers, 
they had me talking about the chemistry of the brain, they had someone else talking about the physiology of the brain, and it was a splendid uh, two-and-a-half-day experience where we spent a lot of time with the other speakers and our hosts at Stanford, and it was really very special for someone interested in genetics and brain research, such as I. But from that contact and whatever other information he had, uh, David Hamburg called to alert me that a man I did not know named Frank Press, who had just been announced by the new president, Jimmy Carter, to be his science advisor in the White House, would be calling me to ask me to come talk to him about coming to Washington to assist in that kind of a role. So with his encouragement, when I got this call, I, I agreed to go, and I actually had um, quite a lot of reservations. I, after all, I'd just been building up my own research program. I was committed to attending an internal medicine. I was uh, in the second year of this clinical scholars program, combining medicine and public health and business. So I went, and I told Dr. Press that I couldn't, uh, under any circumstances, uh, consider coming before July, since I was attending an internal medicine in June. And um, he took that under advisement. Anyway, I called up Dr. Petersdorf, my medicine boss, who was getting installed as uh, president of the American College of Physicians in Dallas. He took the call, and in his gruff, authoritarian way, said, I know all about it, Gil. I've been called twice about you in this job. I said, well, I want you to know, Dr. Petersdorf, that I uh, uh, made it clear I wouldn't skip my responsibility for my month of medical inpatient attending. He said, now, wait a minute. They want you sooner. You should go. And in fact, if necessary, I'll cover the month for you myself. So that didn't leave much room for further discussion. And Dr. Press in Washington, D.C., had a pretty clear sense of the person he was after. He sent me around to see the head of the National Academy of Sciences, head of the Institute of Medicine, head of the NIH, and head of the FDA, all of whom professed that they would be eager to work with me and teach me the ropes in Washington. So I spent, turns out, four years in Washington as a deputy science advisor, officially the associate director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. And uh, the final year, I was actually associate director of the Office of Management and Budget, responsible for more than half the federal budget. A little bit unusual task for a young physician. So while I was there, Bob Day was the dean of this School of Public Health. So Bob Day had the notion that I should, when I come back to Seattle, something I was coming back, which I'd always said I would, and I did, that instead of just resuming my role in internal medicine, that I should consider appointment for uh, chairman of environmental health. He knew that I was interested in the environment. I was interested in environmental and genetic interactions, which we called ecogenetics, a term that Arno Motelsky and I developed, actually a term coined by a man named George Brewer at the University of Michigan. Maybe it's my only previous connection with Michigan. Anyhow, um, I agreed to be considered for appointment as chairman of uh, environmental health, and Bob Day uh, put that through. I had committed, after uh, President Reagan took office, to go to Princeton for half a year and teach there in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, which I did. And then I was selected as the first uh, Brookings Institution Fellow in Science, Engineering, and Public Policy. So I just started that when Bob Day contacted me about coming back to Seattle earlier. What I did was I came one week a month for nine months, and then I left Brookings three months ahead of time to take over full time here in April of 1982 as Chairman of Environmental Health. It was a little unusual way of doing things, but actually it was good for everybody because I was recruited with a mandate to make a lot of changes in the department, to really step up the science and to uh, step up the training program, attract even stronger students, etc. And it gave the faculty a little time to get used to me and for me to learn about the faculty and learn their strengths and find ways to make uh, good use of people who wanted to continue in uh, new and expanded roles. It actually worked out remarkably well. So maybe that's enough background. Let me go back and say remarks about the school itself. 
this whole fantastic health sciences complex, the University of Washington, sits on land that the old timers fondly point out was a very much valued golf course. And some people lament the loss of the golf course, although that's getting to be a distant memory for an awful lot of people here. It was before my time. But in 1960, the then still pretty brand new medical school, which really started after World War II, and they recruited from the University of Chicago, uh, Tom Grayston, a very prominent infectious disease epidemiologist, to come be the chairman of uh, Preventive Medicine, 1960. In 1970, when the federal government provided some incentives for schools of public health in the form of support for training of young people to enter the public health field, the University of Washington upgraded the Department of Preventive Medicine into the School of Public Health. And Tom Grayston became the first dean. A couple years later, the health sciences complex was um, six schools of medicine, public health, nursing, social work, dentistry, and pharmacy were uh, reorganized under a vice president. And uh, Tom Grayston became the vice president. In fact, it may have been that John Hognes was the vice president before that, and Hognes had gone off to Washington to be president of the Institute of Medicine, came back then to be president of the university. In any case, when Grayston became vice president, Bob Day, who is head of the Department of Health Services, became the dean. And uh, Grayson did a wonderful job getting the basic disciplinary strengths established here through the 12 years of the department and the school. And then Bob Day had another decade in which he really uh, made remarkable progress with this school in uh, the period from 72 to 82. Well, in 1982, Bob Day was both uh, dean of the school and uh, incoming president of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center on whose board he'd been serving. And uh, that meant there was a need to find a replacement here as dean. So I had just started this as chairman of environmental health, but uh, some senior people decided I was had enough potential to step up to a larger role Immediately, um, there were a couple other outstanding candidates, and in any case, I was chosen to be the dean, effective October of 1982. And for the next year, I did the double role of being dean and chairman of the department while we did a national search for a new chairman of environmental health, from which emerged Sheldon Murphy from Harvard School of Public Health, a world-class toxicologist, and an excellent choice. Regrettably, he developed uh, fatal disease not very many years later. So a lot of his legacy was to be uh, completed and established. Well, what he started was completely established after his time here. So from 1982 to 1997, I had the pleasure of serving as the dean of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. The name is actually a mouthful. And over the years, there's been discussion whether we got it right. The most poignant criticism of the name of this school came from a man named uh, T. Evans Wyckoff, a prominent downtown businessman and investor. When we stepped up the uh, public engagement and invited some prominent local people and some national people to our visiting committee for the School of Public Health, he was one of the people we recruited. And he was quite dedicated and generous to the school. But periodically he would ask, don't you think the title should be public medicine and community health? So we had discussions about this around this uh, F348 conference room with chairs and deans and with the faculty and even sessions with uh, students participating. In the end, we never changed the title. But the reason an outsider with a totally unengaged view of the history of it and the attachment to the name would make such a suggestion is that to the public at large, the term public health has always been awkward. Most people, it means health care, medical care for the poor. 
and sometimes for a whole community, which is health, which we nowadays typically call health promotion and disease prevention, might be called community health. Trouble is, our basic degree is the Master of Public Health, and um, community health is a degree that colleges and, and non-universities even give. So there was no interest in making the change, but it, it helped us to think a little more about the roles we play in trying to assure health care for the total population with equity and access and quality, and good health for everybody. And regardless of changing the title, it, uh, it helped us broaden our mission and engage people in a variety of ways, which I found very attractive. Let me say a few things about uh, initiatives, because I'm, I'm pretty happy the way things worked out, actually, in those 50 year, 15 years. And um, I give a lot of credit to my colleagues. One of the things we did when I was first appointed and each five years when I was reappointed is to have a little informal strategic planning exercise and agree on what our big goals would be for the next five years. Uh, what kinds of things we want to do to reposition the school, what things we could do to enhance our national leadership position or establish and enhance our national leadership position, which for a, a school that began many decades after Hopkins and Harvard and Michigan and other places, uh, we stepped up remarkably uh, in the time that we've been in existence. So first was that um, we wanted to have really excellent science base for public health, what we call the public health sciences, epidemiology, biostatistics, environmental health sciences, research in health services, and what we hear called pathobiology, infectious disease and disease mechanisms, which later embraced also nutritional research. The aims were to be of the quality of our medical school and of our university in general. This is a very highly ranked and very fine research university. In addition, we all had the view that good public health practice and preparation of our students for excellent public health practice roles and leadership roles, policy roles, meant they had to have good grounding in the public health sciences. And I think that's absolutely right. We also felt that we should uh, uh, be complementary and collaborative with the medical school and with the other health sciences schools and other parts of the campus, which we did impressively. In fact, I was here just a month ago for the celebration of the 10th anniversary of our public health genetics program, which is one of the signal um, initiatives of my time. Actually, it was initiated right toward the end of my 15 years. And Melissa Austin has been the director of that program for the full 10 years. Uh, it's a splendid example of engaging all the other health sciences schools, the law school, public policy, anthropology, and other parts of the campus. Public health is broader more integrative than medicine. In fact, one might say that medicine is a part of public health, instead of public health being an appendage, or often a neglected appendage, of medicine. I think that would be correct, maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek. Another principle we established was that the uh, appointed leaders in the school, basically the dean, the associate dean, the uh, chairs of each of the departments, should be intellectual leaders in their field. And they should be committed to outstanding educational experiences for our students and educational innovations. And they should be leaders and be well-funded, externally well-funded for their research. It is quite amazing. I don't have the current numbers, but I can tell you when I was dean, we had on the order of 180 full-time faculty primary appointed in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. We only had 32 general fund state positions. So we were extraordinarily leveraged on what's called soft money, that's like grants and contracts. We had a new provost who gave me the opportunity to be the first to speak in a series of dean's meetings about our respective schools. And I pointed out that we had this ratio of total faculty to funded positions, and that our really big challenge was finding space. 
for our people and our staff, our students, our programs. The dean of another smallish school on campus, who became provost later, said, Gil, let me try to get this straight. You have 32 general fund positions. You have a space problem. You have 180 faculty. If you would stick to your 32 positions, you wouldn't have a space problem. And of course, I thought he was kidding. But he was being quite logical from his point of view. To which I answered, well, we're part of the University of Washington. This is not a community college where we simply offer a few classes by people trying to cover the educational breadth required for our students. We insist on having critical mass of faculty in all kinds of fields and subfields that are important to the future of public health and public health sciences and important to training the next generation of leaders in public health practice and public health research. To pursue our mission, we need a faculty a lot larger than the state appears to be able to afford. And we do it by competing very successfully for federal grants, foundation grants, and other kinds of monies. Some of our additional faculty came out of very special funding. In the Department of Environmental Health, when I became the chair, the budget had been flat at about a million dollars a year from the state, Department of Labor and Industries under very innovative contract with labor and management uh, through their respective associations, the unions and the, and the Washington Association of Washington Businesses, AWB. Uh, and over the next several years, we grew that fourfold based on performance. We showed them what we could do, and they decided they wanted to buy more service and they wanted to buy more investment in our trainees. We had a very innovative program here to combine training in industrial hygiene and industrial safety in the same person so that smaller businesses of the kind that predominate outside of Boeing and the state of Washington uh, could hire a person with the skills needed but wouldn't have to hire two people to do the two jobs. And that actually cost us federal money because under the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, we got training monies according to the disciplines of industrial hygiene, industrial safety, occupational medicine, and occupational health nursing. And we put the hygiene and safety together. They said, well, you only have three programs, so only fund you three quarters. And we said, well, our principal is more valuable than your money. Another thing that happened during the 1980s was the emergence of the concept of health promotion and disease prevention. Uh, Bob Day before me, the dean of Alabama, Bill Bridgers, and a very few others, and then I joined this very aggressively, campaigned in the Congress to establish a program in the federal government for uh, research centers on prevention, health promotion and disease prevention. They're called prevention research centers. And the question is whether they should be housed when the Congress agreed whether they should be housed in NIH or in CDC, Centers for Disease Control. Ironically, the CDC changed its name later to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But at the time, they weren't interested particularly in prevention resource centers. It was only when NIH decided they would be happy to have it that CDC took it or at least accepted it from the Secretary of um, Health and Human Services. The reason this is important for our school is that when the first competition was held, we had a strategy meeting here uh, with our uh, executive committee, which included student and staff leader and the chairs of the departments and associate dean Tim DeRuin and later Patricia Wall, both of whom were terrific. Um, and we picked a theme, which was health promotion for older adults. We felt the demography of the country demanded this attention. We knew we had all kinds of appropriate expertise. We also thought we should develop more capability in this area. And then we felt we could uh, put a mark not just on this region of the country, but be a national leader. We were selected as one of the first three centers, the only with this kind of emphasis. And it uh, gave us a tremendous amount of leverage on a very important subject. My partners in that included Ed Wagner, who is a group health cooperative, and Jim Lojurfo. Jim Lojurfo's wife, who worked with the senior centers in the community, Mary Ann. Also, Shirley Burrisford and Donald Patrick in social sciences and epidemiology. And we took our programs out into the community, to senior centers 
and to uh, the malls and to public housing. And this was part of laying the groundwork for much more engagement in the community, in public health practice, in the social settings where uh, people needed us, uh, for a school whose reputation had been very heavily built on inside the walls research and training. And I think it's a major achievement here of those years beautifully continued since to have strong programs in public health practice. On that theme, at the same time, uh, Jim Gale, senior faculty member in epidemiology, he accepted the position in Wenatchee as the uh, county health officer and made the trip every week across the mountains for uh, half the week or so. And we built strong ties. Of course, we always had strong ties with Seattle King County, but with uh, other counties, Kitsap and Yakima and other counties around the state to our mutual benefit. I know when Pat Wall became the dean, she actually went around and visited every single county, 39 counties in this state, which was admirable. Um, many years later, I was asked to give a, a big lecture at the annual meeting of the American Association of Medical Colleges uh, in honor of St. Robert Petersdorf, who had been my chairman of internal medicine here many years earlier. And I talked about doing community-based research. And in fact, uh, I took a set of principles that Jim Legerfo had led a uh, community and academic group to create at Harborview and here in the school. And uh, I think they have been valuable for us and valuable for many, many people all over the country. Basically, pursuing the golden rule. If you want people to be your partners in research in the community, you have to treat them as partners. You have to build a partnership that will be sustained even if the grant doesn't come through. And you continue the relationship when a grant ends. You discuss what the research will be and get their input and advice and pay attention to it before you start. You reveal your results to your partners first before you publish. And you build relationships that matter. Anyway, I think this school and this university has done quite well in that regard. Now, let me tell you a few things about environmental health that continued under Sheldon Murphy and then uh, his successor. Uh, we set out when I came here to be chairman of environmental health to build progressively to become one of the major centers in the country. But you can't just wish for it and you can't try to get a political uh, earmark, at least we didn't behave that way, some people do around the country. Um, you have to start with a base of really good faculty, in this case building with uh, young faculty with high research potential. You have to bring in what we call R01 grants, individual investigator grants. You have to put together team grants, we call program projects. And then when there's an opportunity for a competitive round, you can compete against the existing centers for a big center grant. And that is exactly what we did. It took several years. It was a long-term vision. It was a long-term achievement. And it has been sustained to this day. We have a center here for ecogenetics and environmental health. Back to the theme that I came here to work with Arno Matelski, the director for many years now, I'm probably approaching 15 years, is David Eaton, one of the who is a, already here, but just beginning when I came to environmental health. And one of the important things for him was to get him time to do his research instead of um, taking too much advantage of his being a very good teacher, make a good balance between the two. Anyway, uh, uh, he and Sheldon Murphy put together the progressive steps and many other faculty in that department that created the Center for Ecogenetics and Environmental Health. Motelsky became one of the associate directors and Sid Nelson from the pharmacy school became another associate director, and it's a great example of engaging people around the campus, including uh, Leroy Hood and Debbie Nickerson from the uh, Center for Molecular Biotechnology, Department of Molecular Biotechnology of that time. Uh, Elaine Faustman, another young faculty member we recruited in my one year as uh, chair of that department, uh, built up a tremendous program in developmental toxicology and reproductive toxicology. And she and I started a course in risk assessment, a graduate course we call Environmental Health 577, risk assessment. I felt this course should be attractive to students from multiple parts of the campus. And I didn't want it to just be a distant elective for people. So I applied 
to other schools and colleges to list it. So the same course became Environmental Health 577, Environmental Sciences and Arts and Sciences 577, uh, Environmental Engineering 577 in the College of Engineering, and Public Affairs 577 in the College of uh, School of Public Affairs, now the Evans School of Public Affairs. And the result was we got graduate students from each of these four, depart these four schools and others, wildlife and geology and other fields. But we always had, had these four because it was a, one of their own courses. And it involved just what the policy world needs and what our students needed in order to get a sense of grappling with problems of environmental risks that you have to be able to understand the biology and the chemistry, the exposures, the methods for control of exposures, engineering usually, and all the methods for calculating and estimating the likely risks under different scenarios of exposures or of mitigation for populations. And we had the students do projects with mixed, mixed groups from the various backgrounds. Every student group felt deficient. That's the way it is in the real world. Nobody is an expert about all these different fields. And public health and public affairs, actually, are among the most integrated fields. But our people, our public health students, typically were a little uneasy about the engineering and maybe the chemistry. Um, the engineers were always uneasy about the biology. Other people were uneasy about the biostatistics. Whatever it was, they complemented each other. And it's a good lesson in team science, team building, public policy, uh, serious effort. When I became dean in 1982, it was actually a very uh, tough budget time for the state of Washington. The university budget was under a lot of pressure. We had to make cuts in the budget, which were unpleasant. And one of the lines, which was quite robust at the end of Bob Day's time, was a program here that he had negotiated with the leadership of the legislature and the head of the uh, Department of Social and Health Services of the executive in Olympia. On, on uh, health policy. And we, quite a, an array of, of good reports was produced over multiple years through the 1970s. And they uh, were used by the legislature and the government in Olympia in quite a few topics. But instead of cutting the program out, what we did was to keep it open with just a little financial line so the program was always intact to be re regrown. And under uh, Aaron Katz and others in health services, that program uh, really served the state very well over many years. And it gave us a nidus of activity that was able to attract many other faculty to participate to some degree around uh, public health policy issues. Another area where a very small investment has been richly rewarded was in international health. We had individual faculty doing international health, especially in epidemiology. At one time, the department was called the Department of Epidemiology and International Health. But when Don Peterson was the chair and I became dean, he told me that they really weren't doing much international health. He thought it was sort of misleading and it drew a lot of student inquiries when we didn't really have any international opportunities set up for them. And we're a state-supported school, and we needed to focus more in this state, in this region. So that decision was made. But a fellow named Steve Gloy came to me with a passion for doing international health and uh, happy to take him on on a shoestring. He was able to get some grant funds. He did some marvelous projects with students in Mozambique and other countries. And one of the things we settled on was that we should have a few places around the world where we had very good relationships and where we could be confident that our students would have a well-mentored and rich experience instead of just having students go one or another any old place they wished. And that was rewarded by strong programs in Africa and in China and some other places. And now, of course, with the emergence of the Gates Foundation here in Seattle and the establishment of the Department of Global Health jointly between the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health, with King Holmes as the first chair, and Steve Gloyd still here and a prominent member, and with the investment in the Institute for uh, uh, health metrics that brought uh, Christopher Murray from Harvard to the, to Seattle and I hope to a significant role here in the school. Uh, Seattle is sort of 
mecca for international health and global health, and I think that decision to invest at least a little in a program which uh, didn't have basis for a lot of other resources at the time was uh, wise and has paid off handsomely. Similarly, I, I have mentioned public health practice, and Jim Gale going to uh, Wenatchee, our engagement with other health departments, our recruitment of a CDC officer to come here for a year or two, uh, who was Mark Oberly, uh, to have a experience in the School of Public Health before he would return to the CDC. And Mark came and he actually extended his stay over five years, during which time he served as a, a deputy state health officer, became an assistant dean here, went back to the CDC and eventually came back here and is here to this day. And our ties with the CDC and our prominence as a practice-oriented, of course still research-oriented, uh, leader, leading school of public health, strengthened through all those activities. Nationally, we have many prominent faculty, and in their own fields, and in uh, work for the FDA advisory committees, for NIH, for EPA, and other federal agencies and foundations, we've had a lot of influence on a variety of programs. Uh, but one area in which I was personally involved is this one of risk assessment and risk management. I mentioned the course that Elaine Fassman and I launched in 1982, which continues still. I had the uh, privilege of chairing a presidential and congressional commission on risk assessment and risk management in the mid-90s. I was actually appointed by the Speaker of the House. And it's sort of a cute story because I was appointed by Tom Foley of the state of Washington, Spokane, Washington, and I'm proud of his appointment. But by the time the commission started in 1994, when all the other people had been appointed, um, the Speaker of the House was a young man named Newt Gingrich. There had been a big changeover in the House of Representatives. So I considered myself appointed by him. After all, I was appointed by the Speaker, not by a named person, officially. There were three members from the House, uh, two from the majority, one from the minority, three from the Senate on the same basis, and three from the President plus a 10th member appointed by the uh, National Academy of Sciences, and the members elected me to be the chair. It was quite a wonderful group, distinguished group, and we produced serious and uh, influential reports, it turns out. One of the things we did I would commend to anyone is that we budgeted well, we used our very lean staff well, engaged our members, we held hearings monthly, alternating between Washington, D.C. and some place around the country, including, of course, Seattle. But we finished our work and got our report finalized and printed six months before our money ran out. This is unheard of. Presidential commissions typically produce reports late. They go on a shelf, and sometimes they're influential, and often they're not. But in this case, we had six months left to take our report around the country. And we published an addendum at the end of that with the commentaries we got very useful inputs from people in communities in several places around the U.S. and a lot of other public comment. And we gave our report a momentum for implementation, which was very effective. It's been translated into other languages. It's been uh, sort of the basis for uh, EPA's risk assessment work for now a decade. And it was very influential and is widely cited at the National Academy of Sciences and other places that do a lot of work on risk assessment and risk management. David Eaton worked with the Department of Agriculture for the state as chair of an advisory committee. Uh, other members here have served on committees for the state and for the counties. Uh, this is an area of great importance, and it's not easy for physicians or the public to deal with probabilities, and especially low probabilities of possibly very serious things happening. So. Uh, it's an area in which this school has established a, a national eminence, and I'm proud of that too. Another topic that was quite uh, interesting during my 15 years as dean on the national scene, including my two years as president of the Association of Schools of Public Health, which is the role that Pat Wall has now, was the notion that there ought to be more schools of public health. 
It seemed to me uh, ironic, given the importance and breadth of public health and public health sciences, that there are only 24 or so schools of public health. Uh, before 1970, there were only 11. Yet there are 126 medical schools. Now, many of those medical schools had a Department of Preventive Medicine, but it could be quite small. In fact, I was invited by the dean at Emory University, Dean of Medicine, to come talk with him when I was there, the time I was serving on the Director's Advisory Committee for the CDC, about the possibility they would have a school of public health at Emory. And he wanted me to know that he highly valued epidemiology and biostatistics, and that they had three faculty in each of those areas. So no way would they want, them, they had no objection to a school of public health, but no way did they want epidemiology by statistics to move out of the medical school to the school of public health. He was a good guy, just had no experience in this area. So I explained to him that we had 30 faculty in epidemiology, 40 faculty in biostatistics, and similar numbers in our other departments. And that's the kind of critical mass it takes to have a real school of public health that he didn't have to have, his university did not have to have a school of public health, but they could not have a school of public health without epidemiology and biostatistics, which are core disciplines. And I suggested that his medical school would be far more capable with a full-scale school of public health with a dozen or two dozen epidemiologists and a similar number of biostatisticians as they grew and capitalized on the people who would come across the street from the CDC as they got early retirement, which is what's happened, then with this totally inadequate number of colleagues buried inside a big medical school. And they eventually made that decision to open the school on a proper basis, and they've done it very nicely. Meanwhile, we're up approaching 40 schools of public health around the country, and every one I'm quite proud to see added to the roster. I think uh, uh, for a long time, when we had 24 or 26 schools, we were in fewer than 20 states because there are three in Massachusetts and there are two in the state of New York and there are three in California. So you deduct those extras from 50 states and you're under 20 states with the School of Public Health. 20 states to me means 40 senators. So you can go to the Congress to get an appropriation for schools of public health, and the majority of the states, majority of the centers, don't have the slightest interest because there's no constituency. That's not too smart politically. And of course, the issues and the training needs and the sense that public health really does need to provide the context for medical care, and for nursing and pharmacy and dentistry and social work for better health status of the population, uh, it's really a pleasure to see this uh, growth occur. Finally, a word about philanthropy. Um, as a state university, the University of Washington really hadn't much experience about major fundraising for a long time. Anybody who's been here the last 10 or 20 years knows that's changed dramatically with the very successful large-scale funding campaigns and the uh, names of buildings and colleges around here. But that was tr true of the School of Public Health also. And in general, schools of public health have not been able to tap wealthy patients, grateful patients, or uh, uh, other kinds of typical sources of philanthropy. So I was pleased that we at least got a start in this during my time, uh, and we were most fortunate to have the interest of an industrial leader in the chemical and material sciences industry, Vincent Gregory from Roman House Company in Philadelphia. The connection was that he had asked me, or his predecessors had asked me, to serve on a committee, Environmental Advisory Council for that company, and then uh, on their board of directors. And I was unabashed with the sense that if I was doing something they wanted, uh, that it would be nice if they would do something for my home grounds here. So they invested in a uh, professorship, the Roman Haas professorship, and then Mr. Gregory made a magnificent gift to uh, launch the Sheldon Murphy Chair in Environmental Health Sciences. Subsequently, we had a campaign to uh, endow a chair 
in honor of a clinical faculty member, Ralston Ross, who is a longtime leader of uh, Virginia Mason Hospital downtown and a volunteer teacher in our health, uh, health management program. And we've had other drives since then. So that we've stepped up the private interest and private and public support through philanthropy for the school. And I hope that will grow uh, substantially in the years ahead. We also, through the biotech connections that Tom Fleming and I and some others had, and got substantial relationships here with Genentech and Amgen, and that's another source of uh, potential funding here for growth. This school developed rather naturally a surprisingly strong national reputation for cooperation between uh, public health and medicine. And you wouldn't even think it was an issue unless you went around to Harvard or Hopkins or other places around the country in the 80s, 90s, places with huge reputations where people just didn't ever talk to each other across the chasm between medical care and public health, academic medicine, academic public health. It's really almost tragic. And it was a reflection of the schism in our country between uh, investing 98 cents of the dollar in medical diagnosis, treatment, and rehab, and two cents of the dollar in prevention and health promotion. And we aren't too different from that to this day. Anyway, here, our relationships were good. Uh, we had many people jointly appointed between medicine and public health. And of course, I'm an example. Um, we had a variety of programs. So it was basically good. But even here, it wasn't always easy. I mean, one of my good friends from medical school days, even, and residency, the year behind me, was David Dale, who was the dean of medicine at a young age. And for whatever reason, he would every once in a while call me up and ask me to come in for an appointment, and chat about things, and inevitably he'd come around to saying, don't you think we ought to take the school of public health back into the school of medicine? And I would just put on a big smile and chuckle and say, gee, must be a really slow week here in the medical school if you've got nothing else to think about than that. And we let it go. Other kinds of partnerships outside the university were quite distinctive here also. I've, uh, I think we did quite a broad range of partnering with uh, local health departments and the State Department of Health, State Department of Labor and Industries, um, State Department of Agriculture, uh, pesticides and other health issues. We worked extensively with the Yakima Indian Nation. Uh, one of the programs we started here was called Consortium for Risk Evaluation with Stakeholder Participation, CRESP. So it involved University of Washington and the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Rutgers. There the leader was uh, uh, Bernard Goldstein. Here the leaders were uh, myself and Elaine Faustman and quite a few others in environmental health. And we had Arthur Upton, the former head of the National Cancer Institute, a pathologist from New York University, retired. And Charles Powers, a sort of philosopher and, and uh, big-time organizer of team efforts, very interesting fellow. And Jack Moore, who had been the number two guy and acting administrator of the EPA. Five of us put together this proposal for the Department of Energy to try to figure out how they could much more effectively deal with Hanford and Savannah River and these big, big sites of enormous contamination from the nuclear weapons programs of six decades. So uh, these were very unusual roles for schools of public health and uh, successful roles in, in engaging with the local communities as well as these national and state agencies. We did a lot with Group Health Cooperative. I mentioned when I talked about our Center for Health Promotion and Older Adults, and one of my partners was Ed Wagner, who was the leader of the Center for Health Studies for a long time. His successor at Group Health is my protege, a fellow who was appointed both in internal medicine and in health service in the School of Public Health, became the medical director of the University of Washington Hospital for 13 years, Eric Larson, who was doing splendid work with many colleagues, including Gerald Van Bell and others here in the School of Public Health in Alzheimer's disease. We reached out to industry 
partly through this relationship with labor and industries of the state, the Association of Washington Business, and the labor unions. Uh, we, we are, I am, heavily committed to worker health and safety, and our businesses in the state generally perform at a pretty good level. But it requires advocacy, it requires strong unions, and that was an important role for us. And same at the national level. Uh, with regard to industry, uh, we worked with various um, companies, all size companies in this state, through our contract with Labor and Industries, a very important responsibility which we put a lot of effort into, and we got political support in return. We also f placed students in good jobs with uh, these companies. And we placed deep students as uh, technical people with the uh, Washington State Labor Council, too. And nationally, um, I mentioned my own corporate contacts with Roman Haas and Amgen. Tom Fleming was involved with Genentech. Other people had a few contacts. This was not a big feature here, but it's an important aspect, uh, which I hope will grow in the years ahead. But wherever we were, we brought science, and we brought uh, objectivity, and we tried hard to understand the other person's point of view, which is basic golden rule. Put yourself in the other person's place, both for individual behavior and for institutional objectives, and it usually turns out for the better. One very important national activity, which I was proud to promote for many of our faculty, is the National Academy of Sciences and its National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine. The um, uh, National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine produce very important reports, often influential on a great variety of topics, disproportionately involving public health and risks. And there's a need for experts to serve on the study committees and as reviewers, and we've done our share and more in that role. It's also a great opportunity for our young people and senior faculty to gain national uh, attention and to participate in sometimes uh, important analyses that change public policy. I myself have tremendous involvement with the Academy, and that continues to this day. I want to tell you a story about my recruiting Pat Wall to be the social dean. Tim DeRuin had been social dean with Bob Day, and I, I uh, reappointed him when I came in, and I was pleased to work with him. And we agreed we'd do it for up to three years, which we did. And in the meantime, he had developed a major research interest in the dental school, which uh, blossomed very nicely. In fact, he later became chairman of a department in the dental school, which was good for our relationships. I was determined, since all the department chairs were men, to find a senior faculty member who was a woman to be the associate dean. My sense of it was right, and I knew we had many terrific women faculty, and particularly in biostatistics. So I first uh, called in the woman I knew best, who was Polly Feigl. Also, we worked together on a big project, the CARAT study, the beta carotene and retinal efficacy trial with the Fred Hutch, and got that launched. But she had just taken on responsibility for the graduate program, and she said she really couldn't renege on that, and she wanted to do it. So I said, fine, tell me about your colleagues. So then I invited uh, Paula Deere, an extremely good health services researcher, appointed in both departments uh, later. And she smiled and told me that uh, she'd be real interested in working with me, but there was one thing she didn't like doing, which was going to meetings. So I told her this would not be the right job. In fact, it would be a very unpleasant, important aspect of the job. And then I invited Patricia Wall to come see me. I knew about her because she had won the Distinguished Teaching Award, and her photo is up on the uh, uh, gallery here as you walk through the uh, corridor as a recipient of a PhD here in biostatistics a few years ago. Anyhow, I, I didn't really know her personally. And she walked in, and she was all business. She said, Gail, I'm really only interested in talking about this potential role if I could learn a lot about academic administration. I said, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> so we talked about what that meant and her interests, 
and how important it was to me that she would keep up and even expand her own research, which she has done splendidly. And we had a partnership for 12 years, the, uh, uh, from year four through 15, of my 15 years, she and I were responsible for the leadership of the school, together with Ken Anderson, a very important partner for all of us, who was the administrator of the school and was spectacular in his role. Among other duties, Pat actually served as uh, interim chair of the Department of Pathobiology, which needed, desperately needed um, administrative attention. And at that time, she was chairing pathobiology. Ed Perrin was chair of health services. Gerald Van Bell was chair of environmental health. And Tom Fleming was chair of biostatistics. So four of the five departments were chaired by biostatisticians, plus the associate dean. So I must say something about the skills and collegiality and the cooperativity that the biostatisticians, at least many of them, do develop because of their roles as both lead researchers in their own research and essential partners in uh, lots of uh, team science. In the case of Ed Perrin, this was a natural. Ed had been the first chair of biostatistics in 1970 and then uh, resigned to go be head of the National Center for Health Statistics in the Public Health Service for several years. And when he came back, he was at Battelle and the Seattle uh, Research Center. So when we were looking for a new chair of uh, health services, after uh, looking nationally, I realized we had an eminent person right here uh, in the same town and uh, persuaded Ed that health services was the natural outlet for his variety of applications at biostatistics, both when he was at the national level and when he was all those years at Patel. And that worked out very nicely. Maybe the best story about reaching into the biostatistics faculty is Gerald Van Bell. When Sheldon Murphy died and we needed an interim chair of uh, environmental health while we did a national search, I considered the people on the faculty um, and the young people on the rise in, in the environmental health. And I felt that this department needed a strong, thoughtful uh, senior leader for the interim. I went upstairs to the sixth floor and asked Gerald if he'd had a few minutes just to chat. And we talked about the opportunities in environmental health and the work we'd already been doing with him and others to bring uh, stronger statistics and statistical modeling into risk assessment and uh, epidemiology and how broadly environmental health and environmental health sciences could engage people throughout the school. Anyway, he seemed quite animated and full of good ideas. So I asked him if he would do me a personal favor of being the uh, chair of the search committee, which always has to be a senior person outside the department, and also the interim chair of the department, which would give him plenty of incentive to do it expeditiously. And he chuckled and he didn't delay very long. He finally said, it might be quite interesting, actually. So he took it on. And as happens sometimes with interim appointments, you realize that you have found just the right person for the position. And he was magnificent working with the diverse faculty. And he handled the uh, visitors from other institutions, a couple of very prominent people that we uh, considered as candidates for the job uh, without any sense of conflict. Or in fact, he wasn't seeking the job. But by the time we uh, completed the search, uh, there was a sense in the department things were going so well, and Gerald had such a personal style of collaboration and stimulation and encouragement and good, high scientific standards that uh, we were all quite thrilled. I think everybody was thrilled when I offered him the job, and he accepted to be chairman of environmental health. And we had a very good run together as he was the chair there, and I was a faculty member under him as well as his dean. So uh, just another of many wonderful relationships here. I'm very proud of what Pat has done with the school. You know, it's a good example that it's a good idea to get out of the way and let other people take over and bring new ideas and new leadership. And uh, she's implemented many wonderful programs here. I think the global health thing is greatly to her credit. And she's built on everything that we did together. And I did, Bob Day did, Grayson did uh, even before. 
So in terms of uh, sustaining the legacy and putting her own stamp on the school, she's had a wonderful run. I hope she'll continue for quite some time. I'm thrilled that this uh, uh, series of videos is being made of people who participate in the leadership of the school over these uh, now 37 years, really 47 years if you count the Department of Preventive Medicines, I think is appropriate. I'm proud to be in the uh, line of leadership from Tom Grayston, Bob Day, and now Pat Wall. I think we've done extremely well here with the women faculty leaders as, uh, as we built the school. And I'm uh, very optimistic that this school and this university will continue to play a larger and larger role in academia and in public policy and uh, do wonderful things for the people of the state of Washington and for people everywhere. Thank you.